Um, before we get started, there, who was, there was someone here this morning at like 10 in the morning or 10.30 in the morning. Who was that? What's your name? Oh, you just got a free poster, dude. Kevin, right Pick there. Brian has out, a gift brother. for you. Yeah, that's, there you go. Show it to the audience. Thank you for spending the day with us here at Lincoln Center. <laughs> and you got a great spot. Um, Brett, so great to see this movie again. Thanks, Eugene. And uh, wow, I, I knew it would play well at the Walter Reed. The speakers were uh, <laughs> up for it. <laughs> yeah. Brett came in here to do a sound check before the screening and uh, made sure it was sufficiently loud for everyone. Uh, I think it's fitting. Yeah. Well, let's let's start with that. Let's start, let's start by talking about the sound design. Let's start by talking about uh, how you wanted this movie to sound and how that would affect the way we read the film, the way we saw the film, what we experienced. Yeah, well, you know, I'm always trying to create these kind of immersive experiences. And um, the foundation for this movie is really the audio. I mean, the sound design is Kurt. Um, we had a team of guys who sort of took a lot of the um, Kurt's audio effects library and we just incorporated and used as our foundation. And, you know, Kurt expressed himself so vividly and so viscerally in so many different mediums and, and both orally and visually. Um, but sound was something that was really, he was really hip to. And the, the title of the movie came out of a, came from a mixtape he did called Montage of Heck, which when I heard it the first time was really just felt like this incredible portal into his mind and Joe and 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 our team also you know did an amazing job sort of editing sound really you know to 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 take Kurt stuff and I mean our, our the guys who are credited as sound designers really most of this film was done in the offline um, but I just you know the the um, there was not a lot of film footage of Kurt but there is this treasure chest of audio and um, I find it to be more intimate. I find the audio to be really one of probably the most intimate part of the film and a, a great vehicle for getting inside his head. Well, let's start then by, and I made a note of it, I'm glad you mentioned it, the, the tape, and we see it for a moment in the film, in the animated sequence, Montage of Heck, and it's this assemblage of sounds. Um, tell us a bit more about that piece. How long is it? What, what did you, what did it, tell me about finding it, tell me about listening to it. It must have been really illuminating for you. It was because I had sort of, I didn't know about it. And, and, um, and uh, well, we didn't know that there was going to be any audio. So Courtney and Francis had given us access to their storage facility and said, um, you know, uh, go in there and document everything. And nobody mentioned that there was going to be a box of cassettes. And I opened up this box that says cassettes. And there was um, 200 hours of unheard audio in there. And so we went and rented a couple um, cassette decks, which are not easy to find anymore, uh, very difficult, and, um, and started transferring everything. And I pull up this tape called Montage of Heck. And we're in this room surrounded by all of Kurt's art and all of his earthly possessions. And, um, and I put this tape in. And it felt, like I was saying, like a portal into Kurt's mind. Because there's like, if you've heard Montage of Heck, which was leaked a couple months ago, um, a day before we announced the film. I, I don't know. Uh, it was <laughs> divine intervention or something. I don't know. And, uh, and the, um, it, it's like a, 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 it has like the, you know, pieces of like the Beatles and Black Flag and horror movies, Romanian polka and the, the Brady Bunch. And it's funny and it's scary and it's haunting and it's kitschy and it's everything Kurt. And it's so specifically and uniquely Kurt and all the different sides of Kurt. You know, the, the, the you know, sounds of silence and all this stuff. And as, as I listened to that, surrounded by all this art, I felt that that was the thing that got me closest to him. Um, and sort of this pure form of expression. And that kind of, I felt, was the blueprint for the film editorially. And, and both in both editing and in animation, you know, people say Kurt is the last rock star. And I... You know, I don't think we can really say that the script's still being written, but we can say he might be the last analog rock star. And, you know, we wanted an analog aesthetic for this film. And one of the challenges was everybody, all the department heads, had to sort of put on their Kurt cap, if you will, 
and sort of work within that aesthetic and that vocabulary. Um, and, uh, yeah. Quick follow up, and then I want to uh, ask Joe some questions as well. But what, can you elaborate on what uh, Brett spoke to you about, Kurt? What spoke to you about uh, him, the story, revisiting it now? Uh, when did the light bulb go off for you? And, and, and tell us about some of the early steps you took to win the family's trust. Well, I was really, um, well, you know, there's, I was as cynical as anyone about whether there's a space for a Kurt Cobain movie because it seemed like, oh, there have been a couple documentaries and there have been a bunch of books. But they all were missing the one thing that draws us to Kurt, which is the art and the music. And I found that listening to interviews with him, he always felt a little uncomfortable under the, the glare of the media. And the intent for the, 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 the idea for the film was that it was gonna be his art telling the story of his life, sort of his interior journey through, through life. And, um, and then we would use interviews with him to sort of contextualize it. And, um, you know, I just found that, that, that format to be so sort of uncomfortable for him. And so um, we decided to introduce some interviews with his intimates to sort of round it out and to allow his most pure form of expression to tell the story. And you know, it's, it, it's sort of like, if you wanna understand an artist, you look no further than their work. And Kurt was so expressive. And I mean, I think that's why he resonates so much with people. It was, honesty and integrity and and it, it um and that's how we kind of wanted to make the film you know is sort of honest and unflinching and it you know wasn't uh, it wasn't the idea wasn't to um put him on a pedestal and it wasn't to tear him down it was to kind of look him in the eye and to strip away the layers of mythology surrounding kurt and reveal try to reveal the man there's something francis said to me at our first meeting and my sense is having gone through this whole process is the man is so much more interesting than the myth. And that's usually the opposite. You know, usually you're going the other way around with it. Um, I love Bob Evans, but the, um, who's just as interesting actually, if not more so in life. But- um, Brett made a movie about Robert Evans. Yeah. Did I take you to his house? You did. <laughs> Your movie introduced <laughs> us to him and then you introduced me to him personally. Um, but what was it about Kurt? I mean, do you remember Kurt, the moment yeah, that, yeah. that you I said, I want to, pursue this story and, and it was when I saw his art Frank Courtney had showed me some of his art and I just thought this was a really wonderful opportunity but I didn't know what I was getting myself into and as I got into it I just felt that this is in a way the most you know I've done all these films on older people and I'd never done a film on someone my age and about our generation and this just felt very personal on so many levels um, and I found myself really relating to him in ways that I never imagined. And I think that's the, um, you know, I think that's the the, 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 I don't know, that's just the way I experienced the film. I, I really, you know, I, I, there were so many parallels in our own lives and cultural influences and that, you know, so, yeah. What are some of the ways that you felt you related to him? What were some of the aspects of his There were some obvious ones. I mean, I always felt that Kurt's parents, if they were married five, if they had met five years earlier, they would have never got divorced. And if they met five years later, they would have never got married. And it was that generation. Um, and my mother reminds me quite, Wendy reminds me quite a bit of my mom. And my father was a PE teacher. And I, 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 um, I suffered a lot of, uh, I had a lot of issues. I couldn't speak until I was five years old. And I was in speech therapy until I was 16. And it was pretty alienating and dealt with a lot of ridicule and stuff like that. And, um, and uh, my parents separated when I was nine and kind of left me for a couple of years. And it was really, I think, you know, my whole life in a way has been sort of a mission to try to you know, deal with that and I've struggled with addictions and I mean there's just so many different parallels in fatherhood you know I, I don't if I made this film 15 years ago it wouldn't have looked like this it wouldn't have been about it wouldn't have been a family origin story but um, you know I, I and also it was you know for Francis it was so um, when I met her 
this was something I didn't expect, you know? And when I met Frances, see, she shook my hand and said, you know, I just met you and I know you more than I know my father. Because her dad died when he was 20 months, she was 20 months old. And I saw how conflicted she was about him. You know, it's like, you know, people think he's St. Kurt, St. Kurt. Well, you know, he's not, you know? And there was some anger in there and there's some confusion and she had never looked through any of this stuff. And so at Christmas 19, uh, 19, I guess, <laughs> it hasn't taken that long to make this film. It was Christmas 2013, she texted me and said, um, Merry, Merry Christmas to you or your family. How's the film going? And I said, well, at this point, I'm just making it for Francis. And it seemed that this would be an opportunity to bring bridge a gap between a daughter and a father and if anything that would be the the real achievement that we could sort of strive for and I, I'll say that the night that we showed it to her was um, really I think the the most emo you know most emotional and heaviest moment for us you know because we didn't know what to expect and um, you know, after she watched the movie, she said, you know, you just gave me two and a half hours with my father that I never thought I'd have. And I think that it um, really freed her in a way. You know, because you watch the film and you, you realize it's not Courtney and it wasn't Francis and it wasn't heroin and it wasn't Nirvana, that things were in motion long before that. And I think that it, uh, oftentimes with, and, and she didn't say this, this was just my, what I, I sort of thought was that, you know, if, if your father takes his life and you're that young, there's probably a part of you that sort of either blames yourself or, you know, and I, I, she wrote to me a couple days after the movie and talked about that. And, um, you know, I think everybody in our generation sort of felt protective of her you know, in a way, and it was that weird thing of like how people feel protective of Kurt, but they don't know Kurt. And, um, I, you know, it was really, that trajectory, that narrative working with her was not something that was ever, ever imagined. And um, as a father, um, it was just, it was, it was, um, it was, it was, it was really intense. It was really intense. And this guy, we and went through three editors. So let's talk about... Before <laughs> Beshenkovsky moved from New York to L.A., left his beautiful fiancé, now wife, right? So, Joe, yeah. tell me he about... He got married, just got back from his honeymoon. Right? Tell me about the phone call that Brett made to you that led well, you was, to this project. It was his this pr project. producer, Danielle, who I'd worked with before, and she called me and she said, I'm working on this thing with Brett Morgan, um, but she didn't tell me what it was. And then I did a little Google search, and then I saw something linked to Cobain, and I asked, you know, oh, is it Cobain? Um, and then I had to talk with Brett, and we chatted about it. Um, but they wanted me to go out right, right away, just fly out. And uh, I freaked out, and I turned it down. And then a week later, I ended up going back out there. Why did you freak out and turn him down? Just blowing up my life to move out to LA for seven, eight months, you know, just on a whim. Um, but my wife. Francesca, she kind of talked me down from that. She told me it was crazy. And so, yeah, I ended up going out there. And of course, I'm really glad I did. The second he turned me down, I really wanted him. <laughs> yeah, that's what you say. Yeah. So, <laughs> let, so, Joe, give us um, some insight into the conversations that you guys had that would eventually lead to the shape of the film that we see here. Um, tell us about the structure that, that evolved with Brett, and he said he'd worked with a couple of other editors, so mm -hmm. tell us about how you came to this form. I think the things that we really keyed in on was the sense of his fear of rid ridicule, um, and then obviously the family, but really what it is is that everything that happens in that first 20 minutes, that family section, all bears fruit at the end, and it's kind of, it is a very careful construction, so you have all apologies and this angelic music and then when you revisit it with um, Francis you have all apologies again in a different form um, but it takes a whole new meaning you know there was a boomerang thing going on where we felt the first half of the film was sort of constructing all of the sort of psychological backstory and the second half was kind of letting it loose and so as Joe was saying everything that happens in the first like things that like Kim's saying like you know he would rebel against the very thing that he wanted. That would all come into play 
later, and you can almost take any of that dialogue in the first half and apply it to stuff in the second half. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we spent, we, the first assembly edit of this film is this movie. Um, and we then spent four months just shaving it every day. We never took a scene out. We just kept shaving it, shaving it, shaving it. Mm. Um, you know, to try to get the length down. Yeah, we were desperate to cut it down, and at a certain point, it just wouldn't give. Like, we would take something out, and it would just throw everything out of whack. Um, it was just like pulling threads. It would fall apart. It was crazy. How long was that assembly that you, two, before you took a whack at it? 2.30. And, you know, this is 2.12. So it wasn't that far off. I mean, it was basically the same film, you know? Yeah. I made some notes watching it the second time about the first hour, you're right, it really sets up where we're going to go, but it also is so illuminating because even people who know the music and have read so much about this person and this band, uh, it was just so eye-opening for me. Um, I wrote down a note about the all apologies sequence. I wrote down a note about the something in the way sequence, that kind of pain sequence. Mm -hmm. um, maybe just elaborate on the idea of using these songs mixed with the animation and how you constructed sort of those moments to set the tone that we end up you know, seeing later in the movie. The first week on this film, we took, um, listened to every song that Kurt recorded with the band and sort of would deconstruct it for the lyrical content and the emotional content. And there was basically a timeline created, like basically a cut of the film that was just music. So it would sort of be these are the songs, then this is where they show. And um, I knew that, that we had to liberate ourselves from the natural timeline of the music, or it would just be all grungy bleach up to, you know, whenever. And, something in the way needed to be the childhood song and all apologies needed to be the score and the theme and um eugene before we go any further because i know it's really late on a monday night um so all apologies um but i'd just like to in case anyone has to get up while we're going thank you guys really much we're not ending right now but thank you very much for being here tonight it's a real privilege to screen here and um i just have to say the movie's opening friday at ifc center so um i just for you and the movie will be on HBO on May 4th? Yeah, May 4th, yeah. Um, we're going to get to questions from the audience in a moment, so get ready for that. Uh, at about the hour and 10 minute mark, you introduce Courtney Love. Um, the movie turns, and it becomes personal in a different way, using the home footage, the home movie footage, um, to set a certain tone and to introduce us to a different side of Kurt's life. Um, I have to ask you about working with Courtney, about um, gaining that trust, that access, and then how you decide to introduce her into the story at a little past the halfway mark. Yeah, well, she, she had approached me to do the project, so uh, she was a... Um she really liked the kid stays in the picture. And so that made it really easy. She came to me with, um, um, she had, a, with a lot of respect, and both her and Francis, I have to say, that, I mean, the greatest gift you can give a filmmaker is trust and respect. And she waived all of her rights, gave me final cut on the film, didn't see it until three days before Sundance at Deluxe, on the, when the DCP was already created. There was no turning back at that point. And, even then never blinked. And I mean, you know, she gets maligned a lot in the press and what she did was nothing short of absolutely courageous. Wanted to show her, not through the way that we've perceived her for 20 years, but through Kurt's eyes. And that was really important. That was like a big challenge. We chased, Joe came, when Joe came in, he started on the Courtney stuff because we had already been it was we were deep into the cut at that point, and I, if I remember right, I mean we had to ch it, we we had to chase that the, the sequences for it took us a while to get the rhythm of them because there's all this funny stuff, but just because something's funny, it shouldn't go in the film, and there is everything is always doing double duty. So, yeah, they're funny. They're reading the sassy article, but what's the subtext? They can't get away from the press. Even in these private moments, he's still obsessing on the media. And, 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 and so 
trying to, and we had this one, this footage that shows, you know, it, was, it reveals the sort of dynamic of the relationship, the intimacy and the love and the passion, that 25 year old fiery love, but then there, there is always something else going on right underneath it. That Beatles cover is amazing. That way, was like, nobody had it. ever heard that, man. It was like, this is so strange. This is like one of these most like written about and, and observed individuals in the last 25 years. And yet here's this great, you know, and I loved her. And it's a Paul McCart, you know, it's a Paul song, which is like a real, you know, if you, right? Because Kurt's supposed to be, it's supposed to be like a John song. And George would have made sense and Ringo would have been awesome. And, you know, Kurt said he wanted to be Ringo. Like, that was one of his things when he was a kid. He said that um, he wanted to be in the Beatles, but he didn't want to be the lead. He wanted to be the drummer. And, um, and so I always thought that was really interesting that he did a, did a Paul song. And, like, we're, you know, just sitting there, you know, for all these years. And you were asking me earlier. I didn't realize you are What's your name? I'm so sorry. Kevin. Um, you were asking about the soundtrack. And, yes, there will be a soundtrack coming out which will have uh, some of the songs, none of them, it's all Kurt. And it's basically designed as sort of a concept album, so it feels like you're sort of hanging out in Tracy Miranda's apartment for a nice, long summer day. And um, it's like the audio adaptation of Montage of Hack. It's, you know. I have just one more question, and we're going to go to the audience. Um, you interview a lot of people in the movie, or a number of people, um, all of whom have a close relationship or had a close relationship with Kurt at various points in his life. Um, I wrote down in my notes, uh, authenticity of subjects. Um, do you believe them? Do you believe everything they say, or does it even matter to you? There's a lot of subtext. <laughs> so sometimes someone's saying something to me and I may not believe what they're saying, but I'm putting it in because I don't believe what they're saying. You know what I mean? Um, and so, I mean, I trust the audience. I mean, one of the challenges of a film like this is a lot of the type of documentaries, there's an expert who takes the subtext and brings it to the surface and tells you what you're supposed to do. And Joe and I really wanted to respect the audience to sort of draw the sort of um, pull it together. And that was really something we fought. We were banging our heads against the wall going, are they going to pick up the subtleties and the nuances? Because I think particularly with like Wendy, there's a, you got to like, it's intended to sort of question a little bit of the authorship, which is why there's a line at the very end that says, <laughs> says this. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that... Um, I think you can, when someone's being deceptive, you can gleam as much from that and how they're presenting things. There were certain subjects in this film who presented themselves in a manner that might be considered narcissistic or overly, I mean, we're all, especially in film, narcissistic, but a little overly narcissistic, a little dangerously narcissistic. And, and, and that's on display. And that's the intent of what is there so um but not having that clinical psychologist to be able to jump up and say <laughs> you, know, you know it makes it so much easier if you could do that but so much more gratifying when you could trust the material and trust the audience and respect them enough to sort of go there with you well let's see what this audience wants to ask you this conversation is a podcast on the film society's podcast the close-up brian has a microphone so if you don't mind waiting for the microphone so we can hear your question on the podcast, for those listening at home, here in the third row. Hi. This is kind of related to what you were just talking about. Um, some of the more interesting stuff that you guys shot was uh, the father, Kurt's father. He looked very, very uncomfortable. Can you tell us more about your interactions with him? Was he reluctant to do it? He looked very uncomfortable. So That was one of the most intense interviews I've ever participated in. Um, he had never done an on-camera interview, and he's been painted out as the boogeyman, you know? I mean, he really has been maligned. And um, he wanted to speak with Francis. He said he would only do it for Francis. And he came down, and he sat in that chair. And before I can ask him a question, he did a nine-minute monologue. 
covering almost his entire relationship with Kurt. And it was just pouring out of him. And there were about four or five times in the interview where he just burst into tears. And I had to wait, you know, because it wasn't the energy that was needed in that moment of the film. But, I, I, you know, and Wendy is kind of pretty critical about him, too. So I had interviewed Wendy first, so I had this image in my mind, and I met him, and mm, it's not what I thought. I, but, and I, I thought there was so much honesty and pain, and, and I really felt like Don took a, a lot of responsibility and accountability, and I thought, same with Jenny. Jenny wasn't even supposed to be in the interview. She was in the kitchen, and, and I kept asking Don questions, and he'd say, I don't, you know, Jenny? And fine, just, Jenny, just can you sit down here? And, and then she kind of took over, and um, I was, you know, my mouth was sort of hanging open. A lot of stuff that they were saying was, I, I found quite illuminating. And revelatory and you know the movie was intended to be you know it's it's only five people I wanted an intimacy it was very much inspired by Lenny the Bob Fosse film and the interviews were all shot to make it look as if um, you're going from day to night so that you start with morning in America and the, this beautiful life flooding into Wendy Cobain's house and by the time you're at the end of the film uh, you know, it, you're in deep into the shadows, so we had to change. Whenever I would um, go to a new area of questioning, I would readjust the lighting. And if someone started to get ahead of me, I would have to stop them and say, I'm so sorry, we're going to get back to that, and we're not in the right lighting at the moment. And, um, and Joe, I know that we had a lot of concerns because what if someone says something amazing if you buy into this idea, right, and someone says something amazing and it's in daylight but it's at the end of the film, do you put it in or do you not put it in? Well, I wouldn't put it in because I'm an aestheticist. I like the, the idea of this thing going. And it, it, there weren't any moments, fortunately, where we were really challenged by that. And it wasn't, um, but it was something where it just, I, I, I like the idea of the sense that people are just sort of um, sitting there all day sort of, pouring it out and um yeah and it was it was an interesting it was an interesting exercise um uh, Don. all right let's take another question i think in the fourth row behind the gentleman who just asked the previous question we'll get a microphone over to you pass it on down and, and out of, once again, Eugene, I just have to say it's so late. So if anyone needs to go, please, by all means, you won't be offending us. I, I it really, it's, thank you very much for, for saying this late. Um, I really enjoyed the film. And it was cool because I have, uh, I've seen like Kurt and Courtney and I've seen like Last Days and all this. And I felt like there was a lot of information missing that this film sort of exposed me to, which was cool on its on its own level. Um, the one thing I think I was, I'm still sort of curious about, and maybe this is something that wasn't really tackled in the film, but something that you you guys, you know, sort of figured out in your journey to making the film was, um, did because it shows a lot of footage with, with Kurt's family up until the time he sort of leaves, I don't know, high school, something, you know, age 19, 18, 17. Um, did you get a sense that he still had a relationship with his father, mother, after that? He never talked to his dad. He only saw him once after he was 15. Oh, okay. Only once. Gotcha. All right. <laughs> his mother, yeah. yes. But yeah, Wendy, yeah. Yeah, Wendy. I Wendy. mean, Wendy, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing with Wendy because in Wendy's mind, she never rejected Kurt. And, she, you know, it's very difficult for her because, you know, Kurt talked a lot about going from home to home. And in Wendy's experience of it, her door was always open to him. And, you know, I said, you know, Wendy, whether Kurt was away for two days, two months, or two years, the way he experienced it was very different than the way you experienced it. And... Um, you know, it's tough. It was very tough showing this film to Wendy. You know, I mean, I, the first thing I said to her was, there are things in this film no mother should see. You know, he, you know, and um, that was, I mean, that was also, that, that was probably the, 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 the worst day of this 
movie. I mean, that was yeah, just they had a, a raw. <laughs> well, a raw that was that was it, really obviously. tough. That was really tough. And they weren't fans of the heroin heroin material, um, but you know that stuff had to be in there. It would have been it would have been a punk out if we had taken that stuff out and just glossed over it. Um, so yeah, I mean there are aspects of the film I think they they might be unhappy about, but um, I think ultimately they said okay, that's the film. Well, it wasn't that simple. They didn't. <laughs> um, what happened was we, we, Wendy uh, Kim said to me, you know, my brother is really ashamed of his heroin use, and you said you wanted to make a film that Kurt would be would would want to see, and. And I, yeah, we, we got very close to Kim. And one of the things she always said was that Kurt's biggest fear in life was that he would inspire or influence people to do heroin. And I, you know, I was like, look, Kim, I don't think this film has a, takes a romantic view of drug use at all. And I said, you know, when I was a kid, I saw this movie, Christian F. And it scared the hell out of me. And so as I got older and I started using, I did everything there was, but I wouldn't touch heroin. I just freaked out by it. And I was like, what if, and I, had, and I said this, right? I said, I hadn't thought about this before now, but what, because it's not a social message film per se. And I said, what if, as a result of this film, there's some kid out there and they smoke a little grass and they do a little toot or whatever, and they see the film and they're at a party and someone wants to do, hands them some heroin and they go, no, 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 I don't want, I don't want to do that. And what if 20 years after he passed on, Kirk could save one life? And I think if your brother was here today and had the option of saving one life or selling 100 million albums, he would choose the life. And we were at Sundance this year, and at the second screening of this film, this girl came up to me with tears in her eyes after the film, shaking. And you know how Sundance is, it's like everyone looks like they live in Deer Valley and everything. And she was totally, you know, she was wearing a Nirvana shirt, and she's a real fan, and she came up shaking afterwards, and she said, you know, I've been struggling with addiction for years. And, I mean, she looked at me and said, you don't know the pain of opening your eyes after you try to kill yourself and knowing you failed again. And I've been trying to find a source of inspiration to keep me going. And this film, seeing this and experiencing it as a tribute to Kurt, as a testament to Kurt, I'm telling you right now, I am never touching that stuff again. And I, I lost, I went outside and just fucking broke down. And, and it, because it, was, it happened at the second viewing. And you know, I, I, I think that we're all fallible. And that scene, the haircutting scene, is about the struggle between, you see the love he has for his daughter, and even in that state, he's doing the, you know, boom, 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 and he's got so much love and affection for her, but he's losing the battle. And um, it just, you know, as Joe said, you know, we're not trying to put him down, just trying to not shy away from it. You know it. Yeah, and that that struggles. You know, the heroin struggles a very real thing, and I think he was very ashamed. And there's that moment where you're seeing his journals, and there's the abandoned Kurt, and just determined Kurt. He really wanted to beat it, and he just never could. And there's there's that bathroom scene at the end when they're in the bathtub. But what un there's f we ended up taking this out, but they're uh, teaching Francis how to brush her teeth. And it's very cute and very pastoral. It's a lovely family moment. And then the camera pans up, and there are two needles sitting on the sink. And then later in that scene, when you go to the bathtub, those needles are gone. You know, so it was, they had those, bo those two things going on all the time. You know, and ultimately, you just couldn't shake it. I think we can take just a couple more. Um, Brian, if you don't mind, we come over here, and then we'll work our way back. Uh, there's a woman in a Nirvana shirt there, and then we can... Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, lost my phone. Well, I just want to say thank you for this film. It's um, moving and really emotional for me because I grew up being a huge Nirvana fan since I was a kid, and I was crying all over the place. But 
Um, my question is, our question actually, um, why um, wasn't Dave Grohl in this movie? I read your mind. I knew that was coming. You know, I wanted this to be an intimate film. And I think that we have the five people who are closest to Kurt. We could debate who six through 11 would be, but I don't think there's any discussion that these five were the architect, you know, the five most important people in Kurt's life. And I didn't feel there was a need to have two people from Nirvana to articulate Kurt's experience. And Chris was there from the beginning. And Dave came in a little later after Chad. And nobody ever asked about Chad. And I think that's probably why it's best that Dave's not in the film. But if, if but, but the, the reality is, I, like I didn't feel it was necessary, you know, but I didn't want to be in this situation where it'd be the other screening and every screening, of course, the first question like, usually comes up, you know? So we asked Dave for an interview and, and um, he was busy making Sonic Highways. And I, you know, respect that. He was doing his own project. And if I felt that we were missing something, we wouldn't be here right now. We'd still be cutting the film. As it turns out, we locked picture. And three weeks after we locked picture, Dave became available. And we did an interview with him after we had spent a year and a half putting this together. And that's not how the process works. You know, it's going back, you know, it's like had to open up the film again. And we tried, desperately tried worked all through the holidays trying to get it to happen. And we ran out of time. So we go to take the film to Sundance. We show the film at Sundance. Um, and then we take it to Berlin and, and the film is really well received. And it was very emotional going out with this film and talking about it. And by the time I got back to the edit room after that to work on it, this is in last month or February or whatever it was. And the studio was saying, you got to deliver the film next week. Da, da, da. It was all this. I had something had happened. When you're making a film, you, 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 you're, you're like in, your heartbeat is one with the project. And that's why as editors and directors, you can watch your movie three times a day, even a movie like this. Because, you know, Jen, if we make one edit, we gotta watch it all the way through. And even if that edit is in the you know, 97th minute, the only way to properly evaluate it is to go to the beginning and watch it all the way through. They don't believe you. No, it's Bill Platt. I know him. I went to school with him. He believes me. Um, and uh, um, the, 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 the thing was, I lost that. Somewhere along the way, I lost that. I couldn't, I couldn't evaluate it anymore. That's the honest God truth. And so I didn't, you know, I wanted, I trust this version of the film. We're almost out of time. Yes. Um, I just want to congratulate you on an amazing work. I'm really moved by this film. Um, one of the things that I thought was the most interesting was the way the manus the notebooks and the the script kind of informed the narrative. And I wondered if that was kind of an organic process. Did you know that those notebooks were there? Did you know that was going to be kind of how the story was told? Yeah, you know, the 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 journals there were some of the journals had been published and then we we shot 4,000 pages of them. And Stefan Edelman, who I wish was here, um, is just an amazing visual artist. And the way we did that was all those were done on an animation stand, one photograph per page, straight down 90 degree angle, one-to-one -one lighting. And we took that back into the edit room. And the way I like to describe it is it's kind of like um, a director when you walk into a sound stage and there's a set, but it hasn't been lit and the camera hasn't been placed. And there's a world of unlimited possibilities as to how to mine the emotion and the, the, the energy from, those, from, from that moment. And so Joe would, in the offline, you know, we would pick the pieces of text um, to, to deliver to Stefan, and then we would do as many as 35 revisions on a shot to get the right grain and the right lighting and the right texture. And the penmanship and the, you know how he was writing it became part of the narrative. And of course, this is an adaptation, right? It's it's this movie's designed 
to be a movie. So just putting the art and just showing it, like keeping just nothing happens to it, to me would be like if we were doing a book, that would work. But in a movie, it had to trans, you know, become the sort of cinematic vibe of that. And there was so much text. There was certainly a concern of like, um, you know, this could get stale. So it, we put as much focus and energy, I think, into um, bringing that to life in a way that felt organic and felt, once again, analog. And the majesty of Stefan's work, where it looks like it's a, a super eight handheld camera, shooting that stuff, you know, it's just fascinating. And um, yeah, so, so, so we knew that th that was a great way to sort of allow, get entry and access to Kurt, you know, through those journals and through the art and through the music and all the score you're hearing, except for the Jeff Dana arrangements is Kurt. All the guitar picking is Kurt. You know, the sound design's Kurt. It's just, it was a really, you know, immersive experience. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I was just gonna add that um, I think the great effect of having all that text is because you're reading all the time, you're, you, you're so in your head in a weird way and I think you're in his head um, and it kind of just connects you with that material so much more. That's my experience, which I was, when we were kind of watching the whole thing and seeing Stefan's stuff, it kind of crystallized for me. Um, I, I always found that really interesting. Just be very fortunate English is your first language because I've been sitting in screenings over in Europe and you know if you don't know English it's a lot of subtitles to read in this movie you know it's it's not the best way to experience it Eugene I know we're finishing up man I gotta thank you you've been such a wonderful supporter of independent film um, and documentaries and free work with IndieWire and here and and so it's just it's a real honor to share a stage with you man thank you so much for having us thank you uh joe beshenkovsky and thank you brett morgan